So, if you haven't been with us in a couple of weeks, we're in the middle of a series that we're simply calling Good News. We believe that the good news of Jesus started in the manger. And we believe that the good news that Jesus spoke of throughout his ministry, you already start to see like little glimpses of it. You already start to see little bits of it in the story of, of the Jesus who came to this earth. So my hope is, is as we continue to look week by week into, the, into the, uh, the characters of the story or the people who were present, I think we find places where God has something specifically for us. This good news, or as it's been translated, the gospel. Everybody say gospel. This gospel of Jesus, we throw this word around a lot, this gospel, but really simply what it means is good news, like news that's worth sharing, news that we shouldn't sit on, news that we shouldn't wait till Christmas to talk about, news that's bigger than just showing up on a Sunday for Easter. It's the kind of news that's supposed to impact us every single day. It's the good news, the gospel of Jesus and we shouldn't miss it. We shouldn't miss it. The bottom line for this whole entire series that we're doing is that in the story of the birth of Christ, the good news is already becoming clear. We talked about it in week one. In the first week of Advent, we celebrate the good news of a God who hears our prayer, has a plan for our lives, and sent his son to save the world. And we talked about a man named Zechariah. A man who's a part of the good news plan. And then last week, Jesse shared with us a little bit about the shepherds. And in week two, we said the second week of Advent, we celebrate the good news of a God who came for all people. And he can use whomever he chooses. Listen, if you think that you're not going to be chosen by God because you're not smart enough or you're not, you're not wealthy enough. I think you're missing the point of the entire gospel. The good news is that Jesus came for all of us and he sees all of us individually. So today we're going to move that just a little bit more forward with another person in the story of the birth of Jesus, a man named Joseph. Now I got to be honest with you. You guys, you guys ever get out your like nativity, for those of you who have nativities at, at your house, and some, the way we pack ours away, typically, is they're packed in individual boxes. It's, it's the willow tree nativity set, right? You guys are familiar with willow tree? The ones, the creepy ones without faces, <laughs> right? So we, we pack ours away, and when we get them out, I'm reminded that they don't have a face, and that freaks me out every year. But if someone else gets them out of the boxes... If I can just be real transparent with you, sometimes I can't tell which one's Joseph. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes Joseph and the shepherds kind of look alike. Sometimes Joseph even gets like a shepherd's staff in, the, in the, the nativity. It's almost like his character doesn't have any defining moment, right? I mean, if there's not little sheep attached to the statue, it's real easy to get them confused. Am I alone? All right. But what I want to share with you this morning is I think this man, Joseph, is actually much more than just a shepherd lookalike. He's much more than just the guy who's on the journey. I actually think he's pretty special. And that's what I want to talk about today. So, who was Joseph? We know he was a carpenter, we know that was his trade. Uh, in fact, the word carpenter in, that, in the first century could have meant that he worked with metal. It could have meant anything. We believe he was actually a carpenter, that he worked with wood. He worked with his hands. Joseph actually is part of royalty. How, how does a man who's part of royalty get stuck in Nazareth, which is considered the backwoods, how does he get stuck in Nazareth just like doing carpentry? Well, King David, way back in the Old Testament, a thousand years earlier, King David had a son who had a son who had a son, and this royal line that started with David just continued and continued until there came uh, some political unrest about 500 years later, 
And the people of Israel were taken captive by the Babylonians. We call that the Babylonian exile. And the king of Israel was no longer king. He was now a criminal. He was now imprisoned. He was now in Babylon, no longer in Israel. And eventually over time, through a really awesome story that we don't have time for today, through this really awesome story, we find the people of Israel allowed to go home less than 100 years later. But when they return, there is no more king. That land belongs to a place called Persia, eventually belonging to the Greeks, eventually belonging to the Romans. There is no more king. So this lineage, this this kingly line, all of a sudden, 11 generations after they were taken into exile, this kingly line ends up with this unassuming man named Joseph who lives in an unassuming place called Nazareth. And this is the line in which Jesus comes from. So, I don't know how it went, but at some point, Joseph and Mary locked eyes. And he said, what's up? I'm Joe. (laughs) She said, hey, I'm Mary. (laughs) Something happened. Something happened. And they began this journey together. Okay? So we're going to jump into Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. We are actually going to jump a little bit today because the story of the birth of Jesus kind of lives simultaneously in the book of Matthew and in the book of Luke. So we're going to kind of straddle both as we journey together. But it says, this is how, in verse 18, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah. Everybody say Messiah. Man, this, the, he's the Savior, the anointed one, the one who's come. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. That's crazy talk, right? I mean, come on. Crazy talk. She locks eyes with this guy They figure out that they're going to journey together through life. And now she's pregnant? Hmm. I think it's really important in this moment that we have a better understanding of Jewish weddings and how they work. So there are three parts of a Jewish wedding. There's the matchmaking, the betrothal, and then the wedding itself. Okay, sometimes the matchmaking and the betrothal are kind of slammed together. But basically, there's the matchmaking, the kiddushin. There's the betrothal, which is the irusin. And then eventually the wedding, which is the nisuin. So there's a matchmaking component where two families come together and they make a decision that it would be good for these two to be husband and wife. Okay, typically in Jewish culture, that was not forced on people. You didn't have to marry someone you didn't like. You made a decision that you would enter into that even though you weren't dating or anything like that. Okay, there's this matchmaking. And then eventually these families get together and they have this contractual relationship where, yes, we will allow you to, Joseph, to marry our daughter. And and yes, you will provide her a healthy home. And here are the rules and the contract for our relationship. We call that a betrothal. It's very important that we understand that Mary and Joseph were not engaged. They were betrothed. Okay? The contract had been signed. They are officially husband and wife already. They just haven't had a wedding. They're betrothed. And they would take this period of time, usually lasting about a year, where Joseph would fix up his house to get ready to add someone new to his home. And Mary would pledge herself uh, faithful to Joseph by not being sexually active with anyone. So imagine in this period of time, this betrothal period where her job is to stay pure and his job is to prepare for her, all of a sudden Joseph gets word that she's pregnant. His wife the one he's married to already is pregnant. Joseph was an honorable man. And it says in verse 19, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, 
yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, you see words like husband and divorce, so we already know that betrothal means marriage. Right? You with me? So, he's, he's faithful to the law, but he doesn't want to expose her to disgrace. That verse popped out at me like I'd never seen it before. Because I've met many people who are faithful to the law. Many people who say, well, this is what the Bible says. 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 And I don't care what you think. This is what the Bible says. Right? And I've met many people who are caring and don't want to disgrace others. Well, I know what the Bible says, but I just want you to know you're loved. But Joseph is faithful to the law, yet cares so deeply for this woman that he doesn't want to disgrace her. Folks, I think Joseph is modeling for us truth and grace as a lifestyle. He doesn't even know about this Holy Spirit thing yet. He has no clue what's actually happened. In fact, in his mind, she's already cheated on him. And even in the middle of his hurt, even in the middle of his pain, he makes a decision that although the law says this, I'm going to do this because I love her. I'm holding both of them up. I'm not going to pretend this didn't happen so she feels good, but I'm also not going to disgrace her publicly to others. Do you know that you can live truth and grace as a lifestyle? You can be the kind of person who loves people well, who journeys with people without coming off the promises of God. You can do both, and you don't have to sacrifice one for the other. I think we've entered into a season that's lasted at least 100 years, if not longer, where we think we have to choose. Man, am I going to tell them the truth because they need to hear it? Or am I going to let them off the hook because I'm supposed to be gracious? The answer to that is yes. It's a lifestyle of not backing down on what you believe and what you know God is calling you to while loving people well. Joseph models that for us. It goes on to say, but after he had considered this, this divorce, right? After he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David. Now, Joseph's dad was actually named Jacob. But he's a son of David because he's part of the lineage of David. And the angel's calling that out. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Don't be afraid to head into the Nisuin, that that marriage ceremony. Don't be afraid to take her home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And if you're thinking to yourself, I'm not sure I believe that. I'm not sure that there's a woman out there who somehow got pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Me too. There are times where I consider this and I go, what? Why do I believe that it's true? Because people who journeyed in that season called it true. And because in my belief in the truth that Jesus was actually born of a virgin named Mary, and I follow his teachings, he continues to change my life. That's why I believe it's true. So Joseph, don't be afraid. Holy Spirit did this. She's got a baby in her, and it's because of the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save people from their sins. You are to name him Jesus because he will save people. That didn't even make any sense to us. What do you mean naming him Jesus somehow is because he's going to save people from their sins? Well, first of all, you need to understand that his name was not Jesus. Everybody's like, I'm giving up now. I don't even know what's going on. His name was not pronounced Jesus, okay? Believe it or not, (laughs) this is going to sound crazy, You can look it up later, not while I'm preaching. There was a great, it's called the great vowel shift of the 14th to 18th century, where they actually changed the way language works, and they changed the way you pronounce things, and the way things are done, which is insane to me that everyone got together and said, let's start talking differently. 
And in that season around the 14th century, his name, which in Greek was Jesus, they took that I at the beginning of his name and they started to change it to a J because it made more sense. So if you would have been alive in the first century and you would have walked up to him and said, what's up, Jesus? He would have been like, who's Jesus? Had no clue. His name is Jesus in Greek. But actually, when the angel came to Joseph, it's very unlikely that Joseph spoke Greek. So when the angel said, you are to name him, he used an Aramaic language, a language that was known throughout all of the Near East. He says, you are to name him Yeshua. And then what's really interesting is Yeshua is not even the language of the Hebrew people right? In the beginning. They actually said in Hebrew, what he said to them was, you are to name him Yehoshua, which means Joshua. So what's super weird and always runs through my mind, and I've probably messed some of you up already, is that when we say things like the beautiful name of Jesus, in my head, I always kind of think like, and he's also called Joshua, like, because that's his name. But the name Joshua actually means, Yehoshua means the God who saves. The God of our salvation. So you are to name him Jesus because he will save people from their sins. You are to name him Jesus because in the name Jesus, it announces that he has come to save. So if you were reading this, it would actually say, she will give birth to a son. You are to name him Yeshua because he will save. And the word for save in Aramaic is Yoshia. He, you are to name him Yeshua because he will Yoshia, the people from their sins. Are you with me? <laughs> this is important. Because outside of understanding that Jesus' name actually means salvation, you miss the point that you are to name him Jesus because he will save the people. In English, it just reads weird. But if you go all the way back, what you find is you are to name him God is our salvation because he will save the people. That's way more powerful. Way more powerful goes on to say in verse 22, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which we already sang today, which means God with us. And that prophet is the prophet Isaiah. I put the address underneath the verse so that if you want to go back and check out Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, you can see this prophecy that came hundreds of years before Jesus was born. So after the angel said all this, it says in verse 23, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. God spoke, Joseph did. Are you with me? Okay? God spoke, then what happened? God spoke, Joseph did. May that be true of me. May God speak and I do. May that be true of you. May God speak and you do. So he got up and took her home as his wife. Folks, I don't want you to miss that Joseph's answer to whatever God had for him was yes. Do you see that? Before it's even asked, Joseph had already determined that his answer was yes. So, what happens next? Well, this is a really interesting time to be alive. I mean, we're talking about living in the Roman Empire, right? I mean, imagine, we've, we've all heard of Julius Caesar, right? So Julius Caesar dies, and instead of giving what was called the Roman Republic to his son, he gave it to basically his adopted son, his great-nephew, a man named Augustus, we call him Caesar Augustus. He gave the entire Roman Republic to Caesar Augustus. And in that time, Augustus turned the Republic into an empire. It wasn't just about all these places that Rome had some control and they should all get along. Caesar Augustus became the first emperor of Rome. 
And while he's sitting on his throne somewhere, he decides, I want to know how many people I'm the emperor of. I want to know. I want to feel it. I want to see it. I want to know. And so he sends people back to their homeland as a family so that they can be counted. Well, we know Joseph is from the line of David. So in Luke, actually, chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, it says this. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. So Joseph and Mary take off, and they head to a whole other place, a good day and a half, two days' journey south to a town to get counted. And while, we were, while they were there, there's this beautiful story of a baby who was born in a manger that they named Yeshua, and shepherds that came and saw him. And we see all of that in our beautiful nativity scenes, don't we? But while they were there, see how I just skipped over Jesus' birth? Because we're talking about Joseph today. When, while, while they were there, a year, maybe even two years pass. And there's these wise men we call the Magi who came from the east to see Jesus. And they brought with them gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They brought gold because Jesus was royalty. They brought frankincense, which was used in, tem- in the temple with sacrifices because Jesus was God. And they brought myrrh, which was used in the burial process because Jesus was human. These magi leave these gifts for this baby. Well, if we move back to Matthew chapter 2, it says this, When they had gone, talking about the magi, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph. This is happening all over again. An angel of the Lord is appearing to Joseph in a dream, and he says, Get up, take the child and his mother, and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child and kill him. Yeah, Herod, the king of that area, had learned about this baby that had been born that could overthrow him someday. He was worried. And he decides, after talking to the Magi, that he needs to start killing babies two years and under to make sure that this Messiah or this king doesn't make it. So, uh, Joseph, take your family. Leave the Roman Empire. Get out of this empire. Make sure that they can't find you. In the very next verse, so he got up. The angel said, leave. So Joseph left. See how that works? All over again. Joseph is just simply saying yes to what he's been called to. So he got up. He took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt. He didn't even finish his sleep. After this dream, he was gone. He gets up, he takes the mother and child, and they left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. In Hosea chapter 11, we read these words, out of Egypt I called my son. And now this man, Joseph, has taken his family to Egypt, and now out of Egypt Jesus is being called, which fulfills the prophecy It says, after Herod died, in verse 19, after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother, go back to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take the child, take the child's life, are dead. And in verse 21, so he got up. Once again, Joseph is like, you tell me what to do and I'll do it. He got up and he took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. Folks, I think a lot of times we see Joseph as simply just someone in the picture. But Joseph, men in the room, Joseph is leading his family into God's will. Do you hear me? He's leading his family 
into God's will. I want us to hear this morning that Joseph is not simply a bystander or a token parent to the Messiah. It's really easy to go, well, he's not really Joseph's blood, and he's just kind of there, and it's kind of Mary's thing, right? Joseph is not a token parent or someone who's simply a bystander to the Messiah. I want you to hear that he is in the line of David. He is the reason that Jesus is born in the town of David. He is the reason that Jesus is rising up from Egypt. Joseph is gracious. He is merciful. He's obedient. And he is the earthly father of the Messiah. I want you to hear this morning that God did not choose Mary. God chose Mary and Joseph. It wasn't just that somehow he was already attached to her, so he went along for the ride. God looked down and he said, Mary, I need you. I want you to give birth to the Son of God. But Joseph, oh Joseph, you are going to be the one who the prophecies are fulfilled because of your family and because of your grace and your love for this woman and your knowledge and understanding and heartfelt understanding of the law. You are going to model grace And truth, before Jesus shows us what it means to be full of grace and truth. Joseph is not just there. Joseph should not ever be confused with just a shepherd. He's chosen to raise Jesus, the one who saves the world. So, what glimpses of the good news are found in the story of Joseph? Well, I think there's two that pop out to me. The first is this. In the faithfulness of Joseph, we see that Mary was never meant to journey with Jesus alone. This wasn't like, hey, Joseph, if you want to come along for the ride, that's fine. From the beginning, we are learning the lesson that following Jesus is never meant to be done alone. We are not meant to follow Jesus by ourselves, and it started with his own parents. Mary was not meant to do this alone. We have been created to journey together. So you want a good litmus test? of how you're doing spiritually? The first question I would ask is, do you love Jesus? And if you check that box, the next question I would ask is, who are you sharing your faith with to help grow your faith? And then the next question was, who are you sharing your faith with because you want them to know Jesus? If you're doing this alone, you're missing the point. We were never meant to do this alone and neither was Mary. Second, in the obedience of Joseph, we see God's provision and his care. Joseph, get out of here. They're trying to kill him. Take him to Egypt. Joseph, don't worry. You don't need to divorce her. You can, you can, this is not something she's done. God is continuing to speak to Joseph and to care for him well. He's providing. He's caring. And whether you can see it or not, God is providing and caring for you right now. Well, Pastor Tim, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know the ugly spots of my life. How can you say God is providing and caring for me? Because whatever ugly spots exist in your life, I want you to know that Jesus is right there with you. Nothing we go through is alone. Because of Joseph, we can see that he has a plan for you and he's asking you to say yes to following him. So, I leave you with two questions. The first is, are you trying to journey alone? Are you trying to figure out what it means to follow Jesus all by yourself and you can't figure out why you just can't break through the wall? Why do I keep starting over? Why do I keep feeling like no matter what I do, it's never enough? Are you trying to follow Jesus alone? We can help you with that. Even today, if you have your Connect card that came inside of your 
your Sunday news. If you have your Connect card and you want, oh, I'm sorry, they're not in the Sunday news. They're in the bullet. They're in the uh, pews now, aren't they? If you have the Connect cards that are in the pews in front of you, if you want to write on one of those, I, your name and your number, and I don't want to follow Jesus alone, I need help finding people, however you want to say it, we got you. We'll help you figure this out. You don't have to do this alone. You don't even have to make that decision alone because we're here for each other. Are you fi- trying to follow Jesus alone? Are you trying to journey by yourself? And the second question I have for you is have you given God your yes? Have you made a decision to allow God to move in your life? It would be foolish of me to believe that every person who hears my voice is already a Christian. It'd be foolish of me to believe that you're all just clicking on all cylinders and everybody's kind of just, you know, we're all moving in the right direction. I know that's not true. There are times in my life where it's not true. But you can come to a decision moment where you can say, Lord, when I fall, I'm going to fall towards you. And Lord, I want to give you my yes. Maybe for the first time, or maybe you need to give him your yes again. Because it's been a while since you've been living in the yes. Jesus wants to change our lives. We have to say yes. Yes. Joseph said yes, and his life was never the same. So I leave you with this. In the third week of Advent, we celebrate the good news of a God who cares for us deeply, reminds us we were never meant to do this alone, and desires our yes before the plan is even laid out.